All right, we have free. Free. Uh, huh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. It's a socialist system in which the land is all publicly owned. There's no private property in land. Um, the state-owned enterprises overwhelmingly dominate the economy. The determination of the five-year plans has nothing to do with the private interests of any given segment of society, a.k.a. the ruling class. Um, China builds infrastructure at a loss at first. It does not have profit and commands of the forces of production. I mean, I can keep listing things. I mean, none of that determines socialism. The ultimate determiner of socialism is the dictatorship of the proletariat. And China hasn't been one since the 70s. I mean, you in a video yourself, you talked about the inter-party bourgeois and what Mao was talking about with, you know, when you're making the socialist revolution, the uh, bourgeois inside your party. And on October 6, 1976, that's what happened. So I don't say how China's under proletarian rule when all their proletarian figures have been removed from power. Also, having five-year plans or nationalized land, none of that determines socialism. None. The relations of production, Stalin said it himself at the end of economic problems, they need a constant revolution. That constant revolution was, you know, GPCR, and it was ended. So how does that happen? How does China stop the bureaucratization of the party? Okay, these are fair points. Um, so the, I, want, I want to do a number of things, right? So bear with me. So you talked about the necessity of constant revolutions. I think those revolutions are still occurring, but they're not proceeding in the bourgeois fashion. So bourgeois revolutions are liquidationist. They're like the French Revolution. They're based on the guillotine, the principle of the guillotine. And to me, the, the cultural revolution and its struggle against the bourgeois tendencies in the party was also a struggle, an internal struggle primarily, against the tendencies of bourgeois revolutionary radicalism that were also, you know, that, that prejudice of the bourgeois era that was also prevailing. I mean, yes, I, I'd say that too, because a lot of the time, a lot of the, uh, you know, the royalists were actually ordering, fighting on the orders of Lo Shao Chi and the uh, rightist faction. So I would say that's true. I definitely think Mao... He definitely was against the tendency of basically just killing everyone because it obviously goes against, you know, the whole antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradictions. You can't just beat up everyone to death who you disagree with. So I do agree that like the whole like guillotine style was fought against during the Cultural Revolution, but also violence was needed at points and it was used. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I defend the Cultural Revolution, so I'm, I'm, you know, you don't have to convince me of the, uh, the importance of the Cultural Revolution. I'm just trying to square with its legacy here. So, to me, um, what's important to point out is that revolutions cannot only be political or cultural in nature. First of all, the revolution, the cultural revolution, was primarily negative. It was not actually based in the development of any positive culture that was, you know, based in, in, in you know... It was more based I, I would, in a... I would, it was, say, I would say that's wrong. Well, here's the thing. Culture comes from the deep reservoir of both history and interaction between the past and the future. And the Cultural Revolution was primarily about this, you know, almost in a way similar to the French Revolution, this principle of the guillotine, of destroying the, you know, bourgeois culture, right? And proletarian culture didn't really have any determinate content. It was primarily say, based like, in negation. It really wasn't that much of destroy all old culture because there was a big movement, especially in the seventies, called you know making the past serve the present. And you yeah, saw yeah I know, I know, I know. I uh, trust me. I read the Bible. unknown. I read the unknown culture revolution. I know that you know the the destroy destruction of the four olds was one stage, and it wasn't the whole. So I I know that right. But I'm not only talking about the destruction of the four olds. I'm talking about how the cultural revolution was specifically striving so much from you, to search for the essence of socialism in the sphere of culture, right? And this was a this was a struggle and tendency that had existed since, you know, the Soviet Union and the Stalin era. It was this this question of what is socialism? Where is socialism, right? So they're searching for that finally in the sphere of culture because, you know, the the means of production were owned by the state 
Um, you know, it, it appeared that the state politic was under a political dictatorship of the party. So now the question is, what does socialism actually look like? What is that, right? So that's a phenomenal question. That's a cultural question. Now, the issue is that those revolutions also have to involve revolutions in the forces of production. And the way I see it right now, and I could be wrong in the long term, but the way I see it right now is that China still has the revolutions that Stalin was talking about. These are economic revolutions, they're political revolutions, and they're cultural revolutions. They just don't happen in a way that's dictated by the principle of the guillotine anymore. And I think that is the accomplishment of the Xi Jinping era. The Xi era saw to a clean sweep of the Chinese corrupt bureaucracy, not in its entirety, but a, I mean a huge portion of it in his anti-corruption campaign. It corresponds to a sociological change in China and also corresponds to a change in the forces of production. So, to you know, it's, it's this new wave of populism that's happening within China. Now... Very good now, you know, whether Xi it can't go far enough or isn't going far enough is another question. I think, you know, that's a debate to be had within China. But it needs to be stressed that when Mao talked about the bourgeois, the bourgeoisie is in the Communist Party. I mean, in a sense, he's right. But just like how Mao believes there's antagonistic and non-antagonistic contradictions, you can also think of that in terms of the outer jihad and the inner jihad, right? And dealing with the bourgeois forces within the party take the form of an inner jihad or a non-antagonistic contradiction. The development of that struggle isn't going to be people marching around, you know, denouncing people in fiery language with, you know, violence and, and you know, uh, the principle of the guillotine. It's going to take the form of, for example, the development of new cultural trends, the development of new forms of public sentiment. The development of civil society in such a way that promotes certain tendencies while neglecting or ostracizing or, you know, sidelining others. There's an entirely, you know, different dynamic that's occurring in China. It's not putting an end to the revolutionary process. It's developing that revolutionary pro process in positive rather than negative terms. Now, where I disagree with the Communist Party leadership and it's in the official in its official capacity, is that I don't think the Cultural Revolution was, you know, Mao's mistake. I think the Cultural Revolution was a necessary thing that had to happen in order for today's China to be possible. The Cultural Revolution freed the sphere of culture from the development of the forces of production such that these two were no longer confused anymore. Because culture was pursued in such a way so as to purify it of you know the class anta uh, the antagonistic class element this inevitably distinguished the sphere of culture from the actual material relations of production which is something that did not happen in the soviet union in the soviet union there was still a lot of confusion between you know the sphere of culture in which there can be like you know let me let me explain to you the sphere of culture culture is also when you know, a bunch of protesters or people decide to come together and organize their workplace differently or occupy their factory, you know, the Shanghai Commune, this and that. This is all confining itself to the sphere of culture. But material relations of production are only going to be evident when, you know, we turn off that ideological part of our brain and we get back to normal. We get back to the normal goings of life and we allow our unconscious realities to predominate in the determination of our life. The Cultural Revolution was defined by this constant, constant attempt to dominate reality under the principle of conscious ideology. And that's just not something that can last forever. I think what you're proposing sounds kind of deterministic, really, because the whole point of the Cultural Revolution was, you said it kind of made China what it is today. I would kind of disagree, because on multiple occasions, Liu Xiaoqi and then Lin Biao, and then Deng Xiaoping, they all push the whole, like, we need to set aside the whole ideological campaign so we could develop the economy. And that was repudiated, the first with, you know, China's Khrushchev and then the Lin Biao incident, and then the Deng's general plan in 1975, all those were obviously criticized. So I don't think there can be 
a revolution in the productive forces and for, without a revolution in the relations of production. I mean, to quote Joe and Lai's report at the uh, Fourth National People's Congress, China saw like 100% or 90% like industry growth during the Cultural Revolution. And that was spurred on by the whole uh, revolution in the relations of production and in the ideological sphere. Uh, even the criticized Lenin, criticized Confucius campaign, it saw large amounts of production increase because people were going with pure ideological politics and command. They were motivated by ideology to produce. And I think the whole separating the two can work as kind of uh, economic determinism because it really um, uh, takes away man's ability, takes away man's ability to um, uh, change the uh, base and with through revolution in the superstructure. Well, I think the dialectic irony, though, is that when Deng Xiaoping put aside the question of ideology, he was doing something that the pre-Cultural Revolution China and the Soviet Union wasn't able to do. Before the Cultural Revolution, there was no way to really distinguish unleashing the productive forces and developing the productive forces from, you know, that was an inevitably bounded up with specific cultural realities that actually served to hamper the forces of production. Take, for example, the Soviet-style bureaucracy that did exist within China. That Soviet-style bureaucracy gave rise to a culture of mediocrity, stagnation, corruption in the form of nepotism, you know, um, bureaucracy itself, uh, you know, the, the inefficiencies that come with the Soviet-style economic system and yada, 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 all in the name of preserving the so-called, you know, purity of the socialist system at an ideological level. Now, after the Cultural Revolution, when the matter of culture seemed to have exhausted itself, the point of um, of you know go of, of of reaching beyond the threshold of culture itself, Deng Xiaoping can now view the level of the forces of production and the economy in a way that's purified of culture, in a way that's purified of the prejudices that come with you know ideology and so on and so on. Now, the great thing about the Xi Jinping era is that at a certain point in the development of the productive forces, now the question of culture actually has reintroduced itself. But it does so now, not according to the liquidationist bourgeois principle of you know the guillotine or annihilation, but according to the proletarian principle of, of uh, positive development. So culture today in China is taking form in an ideological way, right? Um, but it's doing so organically. It's not being forced according to like some kind of fanatical, kind of radical bourgeois sentiment. It's 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 it's, um, it's emerging in such a way that that organically responds to the spiritual and existential need of the Chinese people to find purpose and meaning in the development of the forces of production itself. So that has been the Xi Jinping era so far. But the whole, like, the whole, one of the 16 points of the Cultural Revolution published in 1966 was, or one of the main points of the Cultural Revolution too, not just the 16 point, but it was to grasp revolution and promote production. So Mao saw that only through revolution in the superstructure against the old form could the uh, new content flourish and could the productive forces be unleashed. And I think we saw that with the Cultural Revolution. And I think what would happen with China today is that ever since they neglected the ideological struggle and only focused on the economic growth, they've seen large losses in the amount of the proletarian character of their party. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. I think that the ideological struggle reached a certain conclusion beyond which, you know, um, the question could not really be dealt with in a direct way anymore. The notion that a revolution is going to happen according to the immediate will of ideological, ideologically conscious agents, I think that had to be discarded as a relic of the bourgeois past. Um, I don't you know, think so. I, 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 think, I think that kind of denies man's role in history and his ability to change the world. I mean, even in economic, even in his critique of economic problems, Mao made sure to note that you know, man, man can transform the environment. He can transform production. He can transform a country. Mao did it himself. And also, I don't really think the whole ideological struggle was exhausted at the end of the Cultural Revolution because the Cultural Revolution 
was not ended by a democratic way. It wasn't voted on. It was ended really by a military coup, and the military was sent out to imprison and kill rebels. So I don't think the ideological struggle is really exhausted. And even right. if you look in the party, you can see the struggle between Hua's like two whatevers, and then Deng's and like Ye Jianyang's and Li Xianyang's reforms. So I don't think ideology was really being exhausted. I just think it was the proletarian ideology was defeated. And then it became a struggle between bourgeois ideology. Can you remind me of the first thing you said? Because there's two points I want to address. The first one is, what was the first thing you said? Uh, grass revolution promote production. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay, okay. So it's not just that mankind can change nature. and change. Mankind does do this. That's subjectively the case. I'm not denying man's role at all. On the contrary, I'm, I'm asserting it. But I'm asserting it in Marx's way. Marx says that man does make history, just not in a way according to, uh, not in the way that he pleases. There's always the side effect. There's always the unintended consequence of man's will. So man's involvement in changing nature and changing production and changing history or affecting the course of history proceeds more like a Greek tragedy than it does, you know, uh, uh, I have something in my head, I'm just going to directly implement it. I think, you know, that was, I'm not here to, I'm not, so there, there's an interesting thing. You know, some might say, oh, that's Mao's great leap forward. You know, it, it, it had this unintended consequence of a famine, which it did, right? But, you know, the great leap forward at the same time did have the effect of creating the foundation for China's national industrial economy and infrastructure, which is still used in China today, uh, public works and irrigation canals and, and things of that nature. But I don't think that China's current socialist system discards the role of public, uh, sorry, the role of will and initiative. It just makes sure that that will and that initiative is reconciled with the objective facts and the objective realities that now exist. I do think China's Great Leap Forward or Mao's Great Leap Forward was necessary. It was a necessary prerequisite. But I also think that the great things like the Great Leap Forward, which you know appear voluntaristic, those you know culminated in the Chinese socialist system that we see today. Now, the second thing you mentioned is that the military stepped in rather than it being voted on. Well, I think that's a, that's the meaning of proletarian dictatorship over bourgeois formalistic democracy in general. When there's a certain point of civil unrest that threatens the very foundations. You know, of the proletarian dictatorship as the state order, the military stepping in. I mean, the military is not a private interest. The military is an arm of the party. The People's Liberation Army is wholly subservient, unlike the Soviet Army, right? It's it's an arm. It's the it's the military wing of the Communist Party, which is the organ of proletarian dictatorship. Now, I find I think it was tragical what happened, but. I think it proceeds according to a, a dialectic of necessity, a, a tragical necessity, but necessary according to the laws of history, nonetheless. So for the first part, I do think it kind of denies the fact that politics in command really directs production. And the whole emphasis on production with who can produce the best and not who can produce the best and maintain a correct political line, it does lead to revisionism. Because as you saw in the Soviet Union, under Lenin and Stalin even, their mistake was that they had specialists and one man and like one man heading enterprises, which really seized um like bourgeois rights because it, it's not really worker control, or it is worker control because it's under a dictatorship of the proletariat. But having one person control things is not like as sufficient and not as effective for continuing the revolution as having a group of people control enterprise. And that was Deng's whole thing in his general plan that he should bring back specialists to oversee Chinese industry, to which obviously engendered capitalism because you have people who are engaging in a capitalist form of ownership or overseeing because it's only one person and that engenders individualist conscience. So I, 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 agree when, I agree with you when you, you talk about specialists. I mean, I even wrote about this, right? in uh, my Substack, I, I just don't think it's for these same reasons. I think the problem with specialists is not that, you know, they're, they're, um, there's one person in power directing production according to, like, facts and according to technical realities. I think the problem is, on the contrary, those specialists bring with them bourgeois prejudices 
bourgeois cultural prejudices and bourgeois forms of ideological consciousness. But I think the Cultural Revolution made it very clear where the sphere of ideo ideology actually belongs. And the repression of that struggle meant that when Deng Xiaoping brings back the specialists, he's doing so in such a way that strictly confines them to the sphere of technical um, expertise. They have no ability to have any political power. They have no ability to have any cultural influence either because culture is being thrown to the dogs. Culture is now being allowed to develop and flourish in a way that responds organically to the reality. When you talk about politics driving production, that's very different from you know the, the problem of specialists. Politics driving production is the other side of the same coin. That's what Stalin was completely opposed to when he saw these party, you know, do-nothings who basically were just ruling on the basis of their ideological credentials rather than their actual, you know, skills of leadership and expertise and stuff. He didn't like this, right? He thought this was a form of parasitism. And ruling on the basis of, sorry, an economy, you know, that's based in politics. I mean, that's just bourgeois voluntarism and idealism. Marx makes it very clear that, you know, this is a kind of crude communism or barracks communism communism or a socialist economy has to have a material civil society it has to have a material way of reproducing itself outside of the implementation of political ideals i wouldn't say having politics in command would be considered a barracks communism because politics in command the whole goal was you say um it kind of creates these like parasites and these bureaucrats politics in command saw the toppling of these bureaucrats of these people across the country who really only sat there because they were appointed because of their like expertise, but were then taking, taking funds out, being corrupt, uh, obviously reducing wages, not treating their employees correct. And after that, you saw an increase in production. So I wouldn't say that having um, politics out of command or having politics drive your economy, I wouldn't say that's like barracks communism or in any way idealist. I think it's subjective, obviously because you have to guide the new economy, uh, the socialist economy, which is new compared to the capitalist economy. You have to guide it with ideology, and you have to know the role the superstructure plays in the relationship. Yeah, in a I, I agree with you, but I like just... What, like I just, what China had. Yeah, yeah, I just disagree that it's direct, right? Production. I, I, dis, I disagree that it's direct. So ideology ha it will have a role inevitably, but... To me, the bourgeois prejudice is when you say, here's the idea, reality proceeds accordingly. Whereas, you know, I believe in what Mao said, seek truth from facts. The idea comes from reality itself. The idea arises out of reality itself. So the ideology that's guiding reality, um, you know, that has to confine, the way in which that happens cannot be in s such a way that holds the entire economy hostage to the ideology. Rather, when the question of ideology organically rears its head, as it is in China today, when, you know, consumers are faced with the question, okay, what things are popular? What do we want to consume? Um, you know, what do we want to promote? What kind of culture do we want to have now that we have the freedom to choose this? Now the question of ideology can be a dominant principle, right? Only because that base of the productive forces have been developed to a sufficient degree. Now you mentioned that the the curtailing of the bureaucracy throughout the Chinese throughout China led to an increase of production. To the extent of my knowledge, there was an increase in heavy industry within China. But I think this was just repeating the folly of the Soviet Union's model of development, where it did have a rapid, you know, development of heavy industry, right? But which China didn't have until the period of the Cultural Revolution, when it was starting to rise in, in a similar way the Soviet Union was. The problem is that this is gonna this is gonna bang its head on a, on a ceiling, right? China is still not having access to a uh, the advanced computer technologies that are information technologies that are emerging in the West, which are decisive for its survival. B a more efficient agricultural production. To the extent of my knowledge. China's agricultural outputs were not rising in tandem with heavy industry. And then C is the question of light industry, right? In the consumer sphere of, you know, light goods, which are severely, severely lagging behind in China. So I think the Chinese were looking at what the Soviet Union did and said, hey, we don't want to go down 
that path of development for political reasons uh, and for economic reasons as well. The, that specific, you know, you have to understand that that was a vestige of the Soviet-style economy, which took the political form of the very bureaucracy Mao was fighting against. So, like, that, that, Mao yeah, was... That's why, so basically, the Cultural Revolution, especially in the countryside, it saw increases in production of um, uh, farming. And it, uh, and it also saw not just farming in the people's communes. They also contained light and then some medium industry, especially the larger ones. They actually saw increase in outputs. And uh, especially in the commune of Tajai, I remember seeing a, a film. It's called One Man's China. Everyone here should watch it. But basically... Since the Cultural Revolution saw the increase in production and self-reliance, you were seeing things like tractors and then consumer goods uh, being encouraged by Beijing to be basically produced all over the uh, society or all over China, basically to become self-reliant. And that was the whole policy of, you know, walking on two legs, which I wouldn't say Mao really emphasized heavy industry. He always emphasized the dialectical unity between, obviously, the one leg, which is heavy and light industry and then the other, which is agriculture. I don't think Mao really focused on, on the whole, we need just heavy industry. I would say the revisionist states, especially in Eastern Europe, and then what happened to have the USSR become revisionist as it focused really on heavy industry. And then North Korea too, really focused on heavy industry. They all really lacked the ability to have that dialectical unity and to have some type of, um, uh, not really like, not decentralized as in no plan, but decentralized doesn't spread out. And I don't think China really had that issue until uh, Liu Xiaoqi was able to take power. But then when he was removing the power struggle, you were able to see an ability of production to be able to resume, especially on the countryside. But I don't think, I think there was a lagging of agricultural output, uh, even during the period in which industrial development was proceeding at a rapid pace. I do think there was, but I think it was because of local bureaucracy. And even though the guy who ran the Dejai commune, Shen Yanggui, he ended up being a rightist. He did. The whole learn from Dejai campaign was really to have all the communes in Chinese society basically learn to become self-reliant, learn to produce, learn to work hard because they could be like that. So I think... But can you, can you kind of... Saw a lot of gains. If you're familiar with the commune system and the ways it differ from the Soviet system, are you familiar with that? Or yeah. Okay. So, but you can appreciate the kind of irony, though, that Deng's reforms were not like out of the blue. They were a kind of just continuity of the same forces that gave rise to the commune itself. It's that the commune was a unit of account, primarily economically, right? All Deng did was really just continue to defer. And this was not something Deng did. This was happening during the Mao era. That unit of account was gradually and continually being deferred to more and more decentralized levels. It's all Deng really does is defer the unit of account finally from the village level, which is the smallest level, to the family level of individual plots. But that tendency was also proceeding of decentralization and, and even marketization was accelerating even under the Mao era. What Deng's reform and opening up accomplishes is not the reinstitution of, the inst of, of private property per se, but the reinstitution of, you know, the unit of account becoming something economically opened up, like it's no longer, it's still, it's still a very collectivistic economy, but now it's being deferred to the family level of the, instead of the, sorry, from the village to the teams, because villages were divided into teams, and from teams to the um, family level. So this was a decentralization that seems very much uh, one of continuity. I don't think so, because it saw a more rural market, and it also saw the 
emphasis on small plots instead of large communes, which um, even as uh, Mao quoted in 1975, he said, Lenin said small production engenders capitalism. And especially in 1975 and 1976, in the countryside, there was a rightist wind of trying to marketize and uh, put like smaller plots and emphasis on smaller part farming instead of uh, communal farming. So I wouldn't say that Dong really was a continuity, especially because a lot of the communes were completely um, uh, revolutionized during the Cultural Revolution. A lot of the old bureaucrats removed from power. A lot of them became more like self-reliant. Not really. Yeah, like, but but you know that people. Mao said that precisely because there was a revival, a widespread revival of small-scale production happening at that time, and that's actually what prompted Mao to write his last question for the entire Chinese nation, which was, or for the, the, the Communist Party, but which was basically, what did Lenin mean, I, I'm sure you're familiar with this, by the dictatorship yes. over the bourgeoisie? And what Mao was basically implying is that, holy shit, um, you know, socialism is not going to completely destroy the relations of production that existed before. There, these things seem to be returning today in some form, and Mao is trying to reconcile with the fact, you know, that the Cultural Revolution failed, according to Mao. It was doomed to fail from the start. It would, you know, he said it will surely fail, right? And I don't think he did. He did. He said the Cultural Revolution will surely fail. It's one of his famous sayings. When I know he said in 1976, he said, he basically said with um, uh, the Politburo, he said, um, I've made two great decisions in my life in the first defeating Jiang, but only a few talk into my ears, urging me to recover those few islands. But the other matter you all know about, it was to launch the Cultural Revolution. Um, yeah, he didn't matter, regret it, but it's... Many oppose it, but it is not finished, and its legacy must be handed down to the next generation. Yeah, no, you, you, you're, 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 no, no, you're right, you're right. Let me, let me preface, I'm not saying Mao regretted it. He said but, if it's not handled... No, no, no. The, the Cultural Revolution failed for Mao, right? But that's, that's a dial it's, it's You have to understand failure from a dialectic perspective. It's like fail, fail once, fail better, right? Fail again. So it failed, but that failure gives rise to the necessity of a period of reflection, evaluation, and, you know, learning from the failure. So for Mao, the Cultural Revolution not being finished basically means, you know, there's a legacy here. We can't just go back to the period before the Cultural Revolution. We need to not so much bring it to its conclusion, but properly succeed the legacy of the Cultural Revolution. That's something I think is happening now under Xi Jinping. But I don't think Mao ever said it failed. I think he said if it's not... Let me, let me try to produce the quote because... Because, because after... The Cultural Revolution only ended after he died. Well, I don't think I would agree to that. I think the sent down movement um, was definitely. I think that was the end of the first period. And I think that was more the consolidation of the cultural revolution because with I, I would agree with that dialectically, but only to the extent that I think Deng Xiaoping's reforms were the result of that consolidation. I don't think so because he had uh, the communes basically. Or he didn't basically. He had the communes destroyed. Revolutionary commun or revolutionary committees eliminated. All like the gains were destroyed. Um, I think at the ninth party at the ninth party congress of the Communist Party of China, they basically expressed the need. It was actually Lin Biao and Chen Boda who were expressing the um, uh, need to develop the economy. The Cultural Revolution has ended now. We can go to the economy. But Mao and Zhang Chunqiao and Jiang Qing and Yao Wenyuan and Kang Sheng, they, they uh, repudiated this. They said, the Cultural Revolution still needs to go on. We have secured many victories, but we still need to unite and secure many further. And we need to have successive cultural revolutions after this. So I don't think it'd be correct. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't really agree that the ultra-left factions after Mao's death represented Mao. I think Mao was much more... What do you mean by ultra-left? Well, they wanted a mere continuity of the cultural revolution without acknowledging 
the paradox and predicament the Cultural Revolution had produced. But wouldn't Mao be left too? Because he himself expressed the need for the Cultural Revolution. Wouldn't Mao what? Wouldn't he be part of that ultra left faction? Because he himself was. I don't think so. No. Cultural Revolution. No, I think but, I think Mao Mao was very different. Mao was much more. Um. He was much less one-sided about his assessment and appraisal. I think he recognized shortcomings and problems, and he wanted to deal with those problems specifically. I'm really looking for that quote by Mao. Um, where he says, it is sure to fail. But Mao was saying, basically, especially in 1975 to 1976, when, uh, like in November... Obviously, Deng Xiaoping had been acting premier for most of the year. And then he sees Deng's general plan, and he sees Deng's plans in education, and he starts criticizing them along with his nephew, Mao Yuanshin. He tells his nephew, Mao Yuanshin, obviously, like, Deng's reversing the correct verdicts. And this starts a campaign called Reversing the Correct Verdicts Goes Against the Will of the People. And this campaign was, criti this campaign was continued until obviously the so-called gang of four were overthrown so i think it was a campaign that mao himself was a supporter of and i think mao yeah. knew that the cultural revolution was probably at the most critical point right when you say he thought it was over in 1976 everything was coming to a boiling point obviously the military was starting to can you can you repeat that mao. first part where you said deng xiaoping was acting as premier already and there was yeah, a camp so so Dong, Dong was acting as premier, obviously, as we know, for 1975, for most of it. And then some of his programs, they become rightist, obviously. They look restorationist. So Mao basically criticized Dong's whole plan, which was like, if Dong was to continue to be premier, he would institute this plan called the general plan on the work of the whole nation. And Mao basically says this is neglecting class struggle in favor of like unity and stability. And it puts a very productivist view on how things go. Can you can you link me to Mao's specific uh, criticisms? All right, sure. Um, I think I could probably find like a link in Peking Review. Because I know for I know for a fact I read at least someone quote Mao saying that the Cultural Revolution will surely fail, but I cannot find it. For the life of me, I've been searching on Google, and I've seen um, Mao say like that uh, specifically in 1960. Basically, uh, who was the You're, you're kind of there, uh, cutting out. Uh, Mao did say stuff like that, but I don't think he said that as in a way that the whole cultural revolution was failed, because he expressed the need to continue it. Well. I don't think Mao fully understood what the continuity of that. I think he, I think Mao was dwelling on that predicament. I think he thought it was a, it was like a, a question to be raised, which he didn't have the answers to. I don't think it wasn't that he. I think it was. Find me. Uh, you're you're cutting out, um, on my end. I think Mao's whole thing with new criticism against the rightist win in order to fight back against this and prevent the overturning of the cultural revolution that goes through the ideological struggle because there was a large emphasis on ideological struggle with the whole campaign of you know criticizing the uh, attempt to reverse the correct you're, you're you're right but you know this what form could this ideological struggle take because the prior form that it took culminated in the catastrophe you know of the shanghai commune and the factional struggles that I had to be gone. reined in by the pla so what form does that take you know i don't think mao knows that i no, the shanghai commune that wasn't a disaster it was they set up the revolutionary committee which is really consolidating the gains and as for the whole factionalism the factionalism a lot of that it was done especially by people associated with liu xiaoqi's um faction and then on the other side the other really main part of the whole factional violence were anarchists. Like a lot of them were in a group called. Uh, That's the problem. But you see, you see how it's like a bad infinity where 
how do you ensure that it's not a bad infinity of this infinite fractal of just constant sectarian factional violence over the ideological purity? Well, I that's think why, that's why that's why the proletarian line, they at the Ninth Congress, they maintain the um, uh, whole unite to win still greater victories, as Chairman Mao said at the end of his address. And throughout 1974 to 1975, Mao's whole... Um, uh, his whole focus was on party unity in order to continue the cultural revolution. That's why he had Deng reinstated. So he wanted to fight. But you, but you understand that Deng's through continuing the revolution. Yes, but that line, uh, that the the necessity of upholding party unity cannot be upheld in a decentralized way, which means that ideological struggle is going to have to be controlled in such a way that doesn't threaten the unity of the party. But the criticism coming from Deng seems to be that there's no way, I mean, there's there's a need to preserve the unity of the party um, over and against the necessity of ideological struggle. And it's like a trade-off. But Mao said, he said, unity and, dis unity and stability do not write off class struggle. And ironically... I, I, I don't, I don't, I agree with Mao, but... What does that mean? I don't think Mao understood what that mean because Mao, after all, raised the question: What did Lenin mean by dictatorship over the bourgeoisie? Mao was very clear that he did not have the answers to that question, and he penned it as an open question. And he thought we need to really get to the bottom of this, guys, because if we don't, we're going to be in big trouble. So, well, his whole point was really that we need to continue and you know, further consolidate the dictatorship of the proletariat and that socialism, it really... You no, know, it, it, it wasn't. It wasn't because Mao produced the paradoxical conclusion, which he didn't know how to make sense of, which was that the bourgeoisie is in the Communist Party. But he's not saying, oh, that means we need to go back to the, you know, the, the Cultural Revolution, uh, instability of, you know, uh, of, of struggle sessions and all He's saying, no, this is a paradox. This is like a, this is some kind of deadlock, right? And it was mainly a kind of self-criticism he's engaging in that somehow the bourgeoisie is in the Communist Party. So how do we make so sense of that? Was, so when Mao said the bourgeois is in the Communist Party, it was actually, I believe, after, or it could have been right after or right before the Tiananmen incident, where basically on April 5th, 1976, Deng Xiaoping and the uh, right wing of the Communist Party of China, they incited a riot where um, uh, a bunch of people were like chanting like down with Mao, down with Qin Shi Huang, because that's what they thought Mao was, because they held on to Confucian ideals. And they were attacking policemen, attacking militiamen. And the bourgeois, that's why Deng was removed from power, uh, because he revealed himself to be bourgeois, just like by splitting the party, attempting to, you know, cause chaos in order to promote his fact that that goals. that was not the context of mao's statement though no i think i have found my source but i need to unlock it still inside the party what's that which statement the bourgeois is in the party yes so mao said that i believe he said that after the tiananmen incident or right before both were in the context of criticizing Deng xiaoping in the right though no, Mao's statement was made in the context of his campaign of the question of the proletarian dictatorship. So I think it's by Alexander Russo, the PDF that I'm looking for. I'm just fucking sigh. I'm really just trying to fucking unlock it. So give me a second. Bear with me. So on March 10th, 1976, which is almost a month before Tiananmen, Mao said the uh, capitalist roaders are still in the The bourgeois are still inside the party. So Mao yeah, I'm gonna have to do this. What happened? Yeah, hey, give me a second. And Mao saw the continuation of that through the campaign to criticize Dong, the campaign to criticize the uh, correction of the correct verdicts. All right, I'm just paying for a PDF right now in a completely legitimate way. Give me a second. So this is, I'm sure this is it. If it's not this fucking book, I don't fucking know, man. Uh, give me a sec. Okay, here it is. Here it is. I think it's this precise section. So, so Mao claims that by the mid-1970s, China was already nearly capitalist. 
And the only difference between the capitalist and socialist form of statehood is the dictatorship of the proletariat. No, yes. no, that's not what he says. He said the ownership. Yes, of ownership. That's the only difference. But what he meant by that was not that, oh, we need to pr preserve the form of ownership. He's saying this is not enough, right? There's really no difference except this superfluous detail of who owns it. But other than that, in terms of culture, in terms of the dominant subjectivity, in terms of the way the state you know, works, for Mao, there's this problem that there's no difference. And he considers that a problem. Well, he went back to the Marx quote where Marx really said that, like, wait one sec, let me find it. He said, what we have to deal with here is a communist society, not as it has developed on its own foundations, but on the contrary. Just well, I'm trying to say Ma Mao society. is dealing with a very significant predicament. He doesn't have any answers to it. I think that's where I'm trying to come he from here. To it. I think he did. I think his whole answer was really continuing the cultural revolution no there's no the way fight. to continue the cultural revolution at this point in time when you, the red guards have already sorry the pla has already <laughs> suppressed its most radical moments there's no going back to that stage of the cultural revolution so now all that's left is a i mean there's no clear course of development for the cultural revolution that's what i'm trying to say there there wasn't a clear plan or a, a clear the course cultural revolution it wasn't just it wasn't just the red guards because some of the most important gains of the cultural revolution were solidified after the revolutionary committees were set up and the factionalism was cracked down upon so mao's whole view of the cultural revolution was not that like it ended it was that how do we continue this and how do we you know continue the fight against capitalism and the threat of restoration and the correct view that mao put out is that bourgeois rights engendered the whole ideology of wanting to restore capitalism and that was why the ideological struggle was so necessary and there's a great pamphlet by a man named Zhang Chunxiao who was purged he was probably who Mao wanted to be premier but he couldn't choose him because of the political struggle but he basically explains how the whole point of socialism and how to consolidate it is the dictatorship of the proletariat and how we must use the dictatorship of the proletariat to one continue the ideological struggle to restrict bourgeois but rights. this is a phrase what what is the content of the proletarian dictatorship in actual reality the proletariat in control of all aspects of life but see that's still and what do you mean direct control because mao doesn't agree with that the direct control was the donway experiments of factory reorganization and it was also things like the shanghai commune at the political level so at the economic level but, but it was the a shanghai the Shanghai Commune, it did see. It was the Shanghai Revolutionary Community. That, the Revolutionary which, which was that disbanded way. by the People's Liberation Army under Mao. No, the Revolutionary Committee, it, it continued. It, the Revolutionary Committee didn't have any power. The Shanghai Commune was disbanded. The Revolutionary Committee did have power. That was what made decisions in Shanghai. Because it was a more efficient method than the Commune. Uh, okay, but... That was still controlled by the party. Yes, I don't disagree with this. I'm I'm not like against the party. Like I'm not like an anarchist like that. I do. Yeah, hey, I, I understand, but but well, but the, it was the not a direct. Control. I'm trying to say it was not a direct form of workers' control in any capacity. And it 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 also. Well, I'm not advocating for like a direct democracy or anything. Okay, that's that's what I'm asking. I'm just asking control. what is the content of the workers' control you're talking about? It shows the workers being able dictate the proletariat being really able to dictate life in all of its aspects production being able to fight against the bourgeois being able to continue the ideological struggle and obviously politically a proletarian party in power but it can be usurped by people like khrushchev and that was mao's fear right but the um the content is is again what's what's being to see i i have a radically heterodox view which is shared by almost no Maoists. But my view is that Deng Xiaoping's reform and opening up was what consolidated Mao's um, legacy and which is what actually prevented revisionism from taking hold in China. And it's just, it is what had prevented China from being... Because it is curious how you know China's 
reform and opening up did not correspond to a liberalization of politics. And that's quite a curious thing, right? The the party well, dictatorship would, remained firmly in control and think, still does to this yeah, day. I mean, you have to understand like Khrushchev's Soviet. revisionism made concessions to Western liberalism and bourgeois liberalism. But Deng's well, reform and opening... Say, yeah, go ahead. I would say that's because, like Khrushchev and Brezhnev, Deng was a fascist in which he did not care for liberalism. Well, I, I don't agree with that, though, because there's a clear difference between proletarian dictatorship and liberalism. Yeah. And, and, and if we're not really individualistic, fascist. then proletarian dictatorship doesn't mean individual proletarians are directly controlling society, whether economically or politically. Rather, it's the party of the proletariat that is in a position of political dictatorship. Yes, and that party has to use the mass line. And as we saw in the Soviet Union and in China, I, I do think I do think it. there is a uh, yeah. well, I, I do think there is a, a still a mass line that um, prevails in China. Now, does it does the mass line prevail in the determination of all aspects of the five year plan or policy? No, but in where it's relevant, yes, the Chinese, the Communist Party of China, is immensely receptive to the. Uh, to the line, I guess, to a line that comes from the overwhelming majority of the Chinese people. It's extremely receptive to Chinese people's public sentiments and views and, you know, their character. I think that has not gone away. I mean, I think it has, especially in the sector of, obviously, I don't even think striking is allowed. It may be. I think the... Well, why, why should it be? Why? I mean... I mean... Why should now, forms now, why why should forms of protest well not forms of protest but why should forms of economic disruption be tolerated in a way that is outside of the organ of the proletarian dictatorship because in socialist china at least most strikes were against bureaucratization which Yeah I, I understand that was during the cultural revolution but do you have to understand that china actually important. so here's what here's the problem Bureaucratization mainly becomes a problem when there's political control of the economy, a direct political control of the economy. Because of the reform and opening up, China actually developed a real economy based in the actual material civil society of China. So economic disruption is like a, th it's, it's basically a form of wreckage of the, the socialist economy. Whereas during the Cultural Revolution, you could have protests that were not necessarily a form of wreckage because the economy was not only the economy. It was also, you know, politics and it was also culture. These things were not completely separate during the Cultural Revolution. The compare, think of it this way, right? If, if, you are, if you are targeting, I guess, if you're, um, I don't know, what's a good way to put this? If you're targeting someone's organs for surgical removal or something and as a byproduct you know you're interfering with the the flow of blood the bloodstream that's one thing right on the other hand if you're just directly interfering in someone's blood you know flow of blood blocking it and obstructing it that's a form of wreckage right i, I think it's the same thing in china like if if there is a legitimate grievance on part of workers in china then the solution to this is not a, a directly affecting the economy, the lifeblood of the Chinese proletarian dictatorship and the socialist economy. It is, you know, turning that grievance into a legitimate political, um, you know, form of grievance and protest. And of which there are many, there has been many in China, you know, as a result of the reform and opening up, there was an urbanization process that displaced many peasants and there was national outcry and national outrage uh in many cases you know there was that case where i don't know if you saw the picture there was that chinese peasant sorry not peasant it was an old home in shanghai and they refused to leave right they refused to be evicted to make room for urban development and there was a giant hole created around them like a canal because the Chinese government, I mean, that's how much rights they had, basically. Like, the Chinese government couldn't do anything about it. 
and there was a whole host of national outrage and scandal over similar such cases. So, uh, I'm also being told from my chat uh, that strikes are still permitted in the People's Republic of China. But I, I don't know that person. Really? I'm just being told that. Yeah, I'm being told that I in thought the they chat. Weren't. Yeah, I, I think they are. I just don't think... Maybe maybe uh, what you read is like they're not able to culminate to such a scale. Like if they get to a certain level, they're suppressed. But at a local level, they're still allowed. I, that's probably... Supposedly, supposedly, there's no specific law defending it or being against it. But still, it's kind of a vacillation. And as Lenin said, vacillation to the bourgeois and proletarian line always goes to the bourgeois line. Well, I think, I think um, vassalization is what you said. Yes. Yes, I think to to an extent that is true. Um, it's very clear that you know Xi's anti-corruption campaign proves the fact, right? There was an immense vassalization that happened, and you know there was. I just I don't like the black and white. Framing, though, like, okay, there is, an, if you think dialectically, then you think of things in terms of dominant tendencies, not black and white lines. So, for example, if the bourgeois tendency had prevailed in a given locality within China, this, this is not something that universally incriminates China's socialist system. It just attests to the fact that that one tendency within a non-antagonistic contradiction is dominant. Because, you know, within Marxist-Leninist theory, the primary antagonism or the antagonistic contradiction is imperialism, right? Yes. So, under this theory, the class struggle within an anti-imperialist state would not be antagonistic. Insofar as that class struggle is occurring outside of the sphere of... Uh, I would the anti-imperialist struggle. Class struggle, it, it depends really, because what's the principal contradiction at the time? If it's a semi-colony, then class struggle needs to be emphasized, especially as we saw in China. But obviously, if the country's under direct threat, you can no, see... No, no, I, I think, I think also well. under circumstances... Well, this is the anti-imperialist struggle. See, there's different levels of the class struggle. Okay, there's a class struggle at the political level. And what that translates into is a proletarian dictatorship, which means party dictatorship. China accomplished that, okay? But there's also a class struggle at the level of consciousness and culture. Now, my um, rejection of contemporary Maoism, the contemporary forms it takes, I'm still a Maoist in some sense, but the prevailing forms, is that I think they confuse... How the, these, I think they treat culture in the same way politics is treated. And I think that's a kind of bourgeois radicalism. I think culture cannot be treated the same way. Yes, a, the party dictatorship, that's a black and white red line. The party's either in dictatorship or it's not, right? That's like, there's no room for ambiguity. But the sphere of culture is, is you know, that's... That's something much more ambiguous. That's like, it, it, it's not one or the other, or there's a mix, or there's, you know, it's, it's very much, you have to have a dialectal perspective to understand how that works, right? And I'm not saying the sphere of culture doesn't matter. Clearly it does. But, you know, we have to understand the orders of importance here. Proletarian dictatorship, the most important thing. Second most important thing, uh, you know, as an extension of the proletarian dictatorship, an economic strategy based so that the proletarian dictatorship get back on politically provoked we need thank you neon or appreciate you uh you know political strategy that will allow sorry an economic strategy that will allow the proletarian dictatorship to be viable at an economic level and then the sphere of culture which is what's remaining after you deal with these two things and they're all related i understand this but i'm just trying to simplify it 
But yeah, everything can be divided into two, obviously. And with culture, that's no different. There's obviously bourgeois culture and proletarian culture. Everything has a class character. Everything is partisan. So I don't really think that could be neglected, really. Culture has an impact on people. Great talk in the space right now. And it must be in a proletarian state used to emphasize proletarian consciousness. And that was the whole point of basically part of the Cultural Revolution, obviously. We saw Jiang Qing. She took power of the Beijing Opera and made sure, even though she didn't make some mistakes with limiting the plays to only eight, she made sure that the culture she was producing, the films that were being written, the music that was being played, they all served proletarian interest. And there was no vacillation on the question. I think I think that's a political, that's a politicization of culture. That's not culture itself. But culture is not it's really not like alien to the class struggle. Everything's partisan. No, no, no. Like, e- yes. Yeah, well, not directly, though. That's the thing. So this is where dialectics is important, and it's important to eliminate bourgeois radicalism. From a dialectical perspective, a given film, movie, play, as you put it, a piece of music, yeah, there's obviously that's related to politics, and that's related to class struggle in some way. However, that does not mean... You can directly engineer or directly define its class content to make it politically correct in some kind of way. You have to let culture breathe on its own terms. You have to allow culture to obey its own laws of development according to our unconscious realities, according to our aesthetic realities, according to our tastes, according to our sentiments, according to our character. You have to let it breathe and then you can judge it only after the fact. What you cannot do, though, is just, it's almost like, you know, this is what political correctness is, which is a fundamentally bourgeois virtue, right? It's directly making it politically appropriate and ideologically correct, which all that's doing is just virtue signaling submission to some authority. It's not actually making something that's culturally, you know, possessed of a certain character. I don't really get your whole point to let culture breathe because if we let culture breathe, the whole point of the dictatorship of the proletariat is really uprooting the old society. And what Poli- the that's more- listen, that's political. What you what you are talking about is capitalism. so in law they call these bright line rules. What you're talking about is political, black and white, right? Law. That's po- that's politics. Culture is a sphere that concerns our unconscious. Culture is a sphere that concerns the, you know, our dreams. It concerns our gray area. You know, because as you know, music is not, music, film, it's not just about affirming loyalty to a, you know, a principle or an abstraction or a formality of law. That's bourgeois radicalism again. It's also about authentic enjoyment, right? Do people go to Travis Scott concerts? because they're hypnotized and they're under the thrall of a bourgeois ideology? No. There's something about Travis Scott. I they actually... So. Well... No, I would well, say that... All right, based... Yeah, listen, based... Look, look, based and Taliban pilled, right? I'm sympathetic to your position, but I don't think it's viable, okay? I think we have to recognize there's something about Travis Scott concerts that people do just actually enjoy. They do actually like it. Now, you can break yes. down. Thank you so much, Soapbox, Reminded for the, the don't know. Steel strike of 2009. You can um, definitely Bush break CEO down. A major industrial firm and the you can definitely break down. Prosecute the workers. Far from a country where striking... All right, someone, someone's saying something about striking. I'll bring it up. But now you can break down and do a psychoanalysis of like okay people like travis scott because of this yeah that's fine but you have to also recognize there's an irreducible element of you know enjoyment there that's not you can't premise see bourgeois, see bourgeois consciousness tries to premise reality with discrete ideals axioms and principles okay whereas materialism recognizes an irreducible fundamental reality um, from which ideals, principles, and axioms are merely der- derivative, okay? Now, if the class struggle is actually a material reality, you cannot go about and proceed treating it 
like it's a reality of ideals and a reality of principles. It's not. All of our ideals about the class struggle, all of our principles and axioms regarding the class struggle come from that reality. There's the reality first, and you know the ide ideological aspect is derivative from that reality. And what that means, more or less, is that you have to let reality breathe. What do I mean by re let reality breathe? Just recognize it exists in a primary way. Reality comes first. Acknowledge there's this reality first. And that, you know, and then the question of how do you respond to that reality? Well, that's a different question, right? How you respond to that reality is first acknowledge and presuppose it exists materially, right? And then in terms of how you respond to it, respond to it only insofar as your will is imperiled. So if you go to a Travis Scott concert and start denouncing everyone as like a bourgeois ideologist, I think that's vain, right? Um, whereas, on the other hand, if you absorb and synthesize in a dialectical way the potential bourgeois aspects of his music uh, and produce, you know, let's say revolutionary music that people actually enjoy on its own terms and according to the laws of taste itself, not because they're virtue signaling to a cause, because they're like, oh, wait, I actually like this better, right? That is also, that is how you deal with class struggle in the sphere of culture, right? Just because you're allowing people to breathe and actually, like, you know, express what they actually enjoy doesn't mean you're saying that enjoyment isn't related to politics or the class struggle. You just have to allow the sphere of taste to breathe. Thank you so much, Chris Morlock. Appreciate Western you. Mao sacked all when less than 15 I American think you're treating culture as they criticize China, an abstraction the and not some relation from the uh, relations to production and productive side. forces we have. So I'd say that so culture, culture really but culture really is takes, only culture the f only takes on the form of what the uh, mode of production is. It's not something that really right. culture, is transcendent. Culture is the phenomenal form of the relations of production, okay? But since the relations of production are material, and since the forms of culture are the form of those material re relations in reality and phenomenal reality as they're expressed, okay? You cannot go about treating them as though they're premised by ideas. They're not. They are based in material realities that cannot be directly affected by our voluntary conscious will. I wouldn't say so. I think all culture is really a product of, you know, man's social association. And what mode does No, it's 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 more simple hey, than that. Culture it's, it's is not a product. Production. Culture is not a product. It is the form of the relations of production. But select culture is really only a product. Let me bring up a quote from George Plekhanov. He said, so long as the social relations do not change, the psychology of society does not change either. People get accustomed to the prevailing beliefs, concepts, modes of thought, and means of satisfying given aesthetic requirements. But should the development of productive forces lead to any substantial change in the economic structure of society, and as a consequence, in the reciprocal relations of the social classes, the psychology of these classes will also change. And with it, the spirit of the times and the national character. He was really talking about how culture really only manifests itself as an expression of the mode of production at the given time. It's not some abstract principle that transcends class struggle. It is a manifestation of the class okay, struggle. Okay, listen, the confusion here is that I think you're confusing the material reality of class struggle for the ideal concept of class struggle and the ideological um ideological conception of class struggle so class struggle is a material reality that exists irreducibly to our ideas of it first okay so there, there's not a direct there is no direct relation at all between how we idealize class struggle and the proletarian class position the actual class struggle in reality. There's, they're not synonymous. There's no direct continuity. Isn't that basically just taking out man's ability to change reality? No, and no, because it's dialectical materialism, and that means, yes, man is the master of history, whatever. But 
there is a material reality of man that differs from the direct sphere of man's conscious intervention. So man is a material reality, in other words. And is our will material? Yes. But the way in which our will is material is not determined by our will itself. Again, think about a Greek tragedy in which someone wills to do something and it has a completely unintended result. That is the structure of Marx's humanistic materialism. It's based on mankind entering into relations of production, which, while being of their own creation, exist independently of their will. I would not say that relations of production exist independently of man's will. Because but that's what it. Marx says. He says that. When did he, I don't, he says mankind relations. enters into relations independently of their own... Mankind's yes, enter relations of their own creation independently of their own will. Thank you, Amir. That's what he says. And he said, men make history, but not as they please. Yeah, but they can still make history. It's not saying that man can do everything. No, they He's are not. making history. This is what you're not getting. They are making history, just not a, in a way that they please. No, that he said with the conditions. He said not with conditions they can choose. Sure, but that's the same thing. So Marx said, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please. They do not make it, they do make it, but they do not make it under certain circumstances chosen by themselves, but under given circumstances directly encountered and inherited from the past. What yeah, and mean? the past is also of their what own creation. Is that just not make history from what he's given with? It doesn't mean that he can't no. make that. No, you're you're no, you're you're not you you completely bypassed the irony of that quote. The conditions he's talking about are of the creation of man, just not of his will, just not of his conscious will. We are unconsciously producing this reality. That's the point. That's wrong because the whole point that But Marx says that ideology Marx is on Marx does refer to the unconscious I, nature. The whole observation of freedom and necessity shows that man moves from necessity to freedom. You're basically saying that man is constantly in necessity and can't gain freedom. No, freedom is insight into necessity and nothing else. It's the recognition of it. No, it's insight into necessity. And Frederick Engels' direct words. This kid is totally unaware that his entire philosophy comes from U.S. Intel. Not so are you denying the fact that man can gain freedom from necessity? Because no, man, no, he cannot. Where, Where did you get ma that mankind can gain freedom from? Yes, freedom from necessity as in freedom as the culmination of necessity. But freedom yeah. as insight as in into freedom. necessity. That's necessity yeah. doesn't disappear. Necessity is not annihilated. Yeah. I don't disagree with you on that. What I'm saying is that man gains freedom from recognizing necessity. No, and that man gains freedom. No, man gains freedom by submitting to necessity. Freedom is insight into what is necessary. Because, again, bourgeois consciousness, which it seems not to, I'm not trying to insult, but it seems you're kind of disposed of that right now because you seem to think that we can know, we already know what necessity is. And that, you know, this, you can't, you don't know what necessity is. In order to actually know, see, this is, this is why when you say, but when you say, when you say, when you say things like what I'm saying sounds like economic determinism, to me, this is bourgeois because it seems like you automatically assume that there's some knowledge out there of the economic determination in question or whatever, but there isn't. You actually need to muster the conscious will in order to actually possess insight into what our necessity well, is waiting, or insight waiting, into the development of the force of production. Known. What? It's not that, like, it's waiting to be known. The law of value, Marx didn't create the law of value. He discovered it. it well, it, actually, actually, um, it is waiting to be known insofar as that knowledge is practical. And for Marx, all knowledge is practical. So insofar as you're going to apply any knowledge of the law of value, it is waiting to be known. I mean, there's, there's no, before the law of value can become known by Marx, 
Space. Explicitly. He's mistaking freedom with the universe acts like it does in my daydreams. Thank you, Soapbox. Appreciate you. The, 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 um, the thing you seem to be confused about here is that... Um, I, sorry, I got a donation. It completely uh, made me forget what we were talking about. Oh, okay. The law of value. Okay. Yeah, the law of value... Insofar as that has any practical relevance for us, of course, it's not already known. Like, before Marx develops the law of value himself in his specific way, there is no way for us to know what it is, right? There's no way for us to know what it is. We cannot draw any practical conclusions well, from it. There is a way to know it. It's to investigate the object reality. Yeah, but it, the, you know what this is? This is quantum mechanics. This is what this is is quantum mechanics. Like, how can you know? You can't know the thing until you observe it, right? So, but does the thing exist before yeah, you observe it? It's one of those things. Priorism. So, what quantum mechanics says, which I think is dialectical, is that. It's not that the thing didn't exist before you observed it, but upon observing it, you determined the nature of the thing itself. You have participated in the determination of the thing itself, rather. There's no knowledge out there. My, one of my criticisms of Western Maoism is it seems to somehow be wedded to institutionalization of knowledge. Uh, it seems to have the characteristics of voluntarism, uh, the institutionalization, the, sorry, subservience to institutionalized knowledge or the discourse of the university, um, which is, puts it in awfully co close proximity to an ideology of U.S. unipolar imperialism, I think. Uh, I would not. <laughs> I'm sorry. What the fuck are you talking about? Okay. How is, how is Maoism an institutionalized Can you name me, um, where has, where has, um, let's just call it Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, where has that actually confronted U.S. imperialism in such a way uh, that, you know, has... Peru? No, it hasn't. Philippines? One of the actually, in the Philippines, the CIA helped keep Marcos in power. On, on both, on both counts, power. you're wrong. So in Peru, the U.S. imperialism was entangled, actually, in a struggle with Soviet social imperialism. And in Peru, at least in the U.S.'s immediate interests, the shining path was, would be much more preferable to the uh, Soviet That's actually social wrong. imperialism. So the Soviet social imperialist and U.S.-backed guy, uh, Velasco Alvarado, he was removed. It was Bel Beluande. He was the president when the PCP initiated the People's War, and he was quite pro-U.S. Then he was also succeeded by um, uh, Alan Garcia, and he was also pro-U.S., and Fujimori with himself was installed by the CIA. Okay. So if the CIA had to install Fujimori, how would the Communist Party of Peru taking power, how would that help their interests? Um, I'm, not, I'm not saying it would have, but there was a much more immediate threat as far as the U.S. was concerned. Of Cuban-backed Soviet social imperialists taking power, but it was a threat to the world capitalist class in general. Not having, you know, revisionists in power who would be able to vastly. Well, that is in no way immediate. You can say that's a final conclusion or something, but that has yet. How to... is it not? Because their goal. It's, it's not. It's power. not immediate because look, the shining path in Peru, Bang. as far as material reality is concerned. Very strong. Thank you, Eduardo. As far as material reality is concerned, it's no different from ISIS. It could be any ideology, any group of people who want to but voluntarily... No, in terms of its geopolitical it's consequences, it's no different. How is it? How is it? Because from what I know, both the American... Because say you're right. Say you're right. Right? Say you're right, and the Shining Path takes power, and it becomes this huge superpower that threatens U.S. imperialism. Okay, that's like 20 steps away from what actually happened. What actually happened was that a group of ideologically, you know, charged people were fucking around in the Peruvian countryside, taking over strongholds and 
The consequences of that could not be seen, okay? So as far as, that's what I mean. There's no difference from ISIS as far as the actual geopolitical. No, but, but the U.S. the U.S. were so scared and inclined that they had to back Fujimori and they had to have him. No, the U.S. backed Fujimori even, to be a stronghold against the pro-Cuban, uh, you know. The pro-Cuban, the pro-Cuban uh, Tupac Amaru revolutionary movement, they did not have much power. The, the direct threat in Peru at the time was the Communist Party of Peru. Even the I, I don't think so. The I don't North think Korean so. revisionists themselves, who were really acting on social imperialism from the USSR, they sold guns and gave training to commandos of the Peruvian military. So I don't really think that the so-called shining path were really a benefit to imperialism. I mean, e even even I mean, if they were not a benefit, Guzman, listen, even if Guzman was arrested, even even if they weren't, listen, now. look, even if they weren't necessarily of benefit to U.S. imperialism. They never posed a threat to U.S. imperialism whatsoever. But they did. No, they, they didn't. Did. No, then they didn't. Why did the U.S. feel the need to install Fujimori? Because the U.S. Why did the US was feel the need to back Garcia. Do you think the U.S. supported Fujimori because it was scared of the yes. shining path? Yes. No, it they didn't. The U.S. Of the country. No, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. supported those people primarily to counter the Soviet Union's influence. But at the time of Fujimori's coup in 1990, the Soviet Union was almost a year away from dissolving. And? And their power was not as big as it had once been. And the Communist Party of Peru's power grew. Around yeah, that time, yeah, but, but hold on. Even in 1990, there's still a Cold War going on. Yes, obviously, but it was in... It was Cuba, in a, uh, Cuba still exists. You know that, right? Yes, but Cuba's not imperialist. So, so the U.S. Cuba. has a general strategy in Latin America to oppose, you know, the immediate threat to its imperialist hegemony, which was the Soviet Union at the time. Yes, but Fujimori was obviously a pro-U.S. strongman. Okay, well, how... Fu Fujimori didn't exist primarily in response to the Shining Path. Then why do you take power and then freeze the parliament? Take power and what? Do you think he would have done that? Do you think he would have done that if the Communist Party did not start their People's War? Do you think the U.S. the CIA would have Fujimori installed to be able to um uh, to be able to stop the um, Communist Party? And why did Fujimori have? No, no. What you're saying, what you're saying is is illogical. You're saying. Would Fujimori have taken action against the PCP if the PCP didn't exist? No. The PCP was engaging in violence in the countryside trying to overthrow the government and engage in this, you know, whatever. Yeah, of course there's going to be a response. That doesn't mean that they exist only for the purpose of dealing with that. Well, I would say that's wrong. I mean, Fujimori was a fascist. And if we look at Dimitrov's definition of fascism, fascism is really the hours of imperialism fighting against the workers. Okay, th this is what I mean by the need to acknowledge material reality, okay? So in, in material reality, the PCP never proved itself to be a material they had, they had force. They had 40% of the entire country in the... Okay, okay, let me put it this way. They let me put it this way. Okay, let, let me put it this way, okay? If someone created an ideology called Incan, Incan supranationalism and did the same shit that the PCP did strategically in order to establish themselves as a threat to the state, the state would have acted in the same fucking way. Okay, the U.S. doesn't care what ideology Wacko, had, if you know what Wacko was, had, or Ruby Ridge, doesn't matter. If you establish yourself as a threat to the national security... They're going to fucking respond accordingly. That doesn't mean they care about your ideology. They don't. They don't care if you're a Maoist. They don't care what you are. The only decisive significance of Marxism-Leninism happens after you take power. After you take power and you start to revolutionize the forces of production, and that's when it really shows that actually, yeah, your ideology was the thing that I'd made the difference. Because, because the U.S. has historically been opportunistic towards groups that have um, engaged in armed violence against states. Like, obviously... Hey, do you think the U.S. has never like, supported Maoists? I don't think the U.S. has supported They have. Maoists. Has the U.S. armed Kurdish Maoists? I don't think they... Uh, no. Because TKP yes, they no, have. They, they, they withdrew. It was, it was YPG. They withdrew. 
It was the YPG. It's not, that's they the they may have withdrew, uh, according to you now, but they have always supported the Kurds against Iran and against Syria and even against Turkey. They always have. But TKPML, TKPML only, they didn't support them against Turkey because Turkey's in the U.S. interest. But TKPML well, is that's, like, that's where, yeah, makes you think. But they did support them against Iran. Everyone knows that. They didn't support Maoists against Iran. Yes, they did. When? They support Kurdish separatists against Iran, many of whom are Maoists. No, that's not true. Yes, because, they do. Because TKPML, the Communist Party of Turkey, Marxist Leninist, who also fights for Kurdistan too, they withdrew from Rojava. Okay. And they're opposed to the PKK. They only went into Rojava to fight ISIS. They did not go to fight for the U.S. Look, it it doesn't and, it it, do, it doesn't it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The U.S. has supported. They themselves said that. The PKK are oil mercenaries who fight for U.S. imperialist interests, and they have drawn a clear line. That's fine. That's fine. But the U.S. has supported Maoists. No, they haven't. Is there is there any is there any evidence that NATO went to these TKPML strongholds and said, "Here's weapons"? No, but you know they did distribute weapons to Kurds, and those weapons went into the hands of Maoists. I don't know if that's true. And also, Turkey of course is an it's American. True. Turkey's an American ally. What what good would the U.S. do? Okay, did the FBI? Turkey? Did the okay? Let me ask you a question. Did the FBI support Maoists during the uh, New Left? No, oh, they weren't. Yes. Maoists. Okay, well, you can say they weren't real Maoists, but the they FBI weren't did. They were real Maoists because they were federal agents. Okay, but there no, there were actual fanatical Maoists who were true believers who were supported by the FBI to cause instability. That could be debated, and there's a book called Heavy Radicals I think you should read. But I don't think I don't think Maoists would ever say we need a tactical agreement with the FBI or U.S. imperialism. Look, they may not. But I'm just trying to tell you that Maoists have never been a threat to U.S. imperialism, ever. They have been. In Peru? The they have not. Uh, in, in, both India, those, in, in both of those, in both of those, no. They have never. Up. They have never Paul? been a threat to U.S. imperialism. You are talking about indirect threats to vassals of the United States. Okay? Um, and, it, it's, it's, it, and then at that point, that's not them threatening U.S. imperialism. That's them causing trouble for states who are subordinated to imperialism. Actually, for non... Like, Mao would consider these second world countries who are not necessarily synonymous with U.S. imperialism, but, you know, have contradictions within them about, you know, which hegemon they're favoring. Yes, but the countries that Maoists fight in are all third world countries, which are under the dominance of U.S. imperialism. Turkey, Philippines... See, the thing Europe. is, Mao... No, I no. Turkey and the Philippines today are definitely developed to a proper extent to make them second no, world. No, under Mao's Turkey's definition, not. especially. Okay, especially why, why did Mao? Okay, why did Mao say that Europe was second world? Because Europe, Europe back then is was more developed than Turkey is today, and the Philippines too. Yeah, I. That's really not. I mean, Mao considered South Korea part of the second world too. I'd agree with that with the level of development. Yeah. It's still imperialized, though. Okay, but South Korea was second world in Mao's time. And that's, there's, and Turkey today is more developed than South Korea was back then. And so was the Philippines. Thank you, Chris so. Ask this Yeah, it is. This was before their economic miracle. Their economic miracle made South Korea into an advanced, you know, moderately well-off country. Mao considered Taiwan to be a second world country. Well, he didn't consider it a country at all, but he considered these strong men to be base areas of imperialism. He said these are. He considered he, he considered them to be uh, second world countries in contradiction to U.S. imperialism. Like because, De Gaulle, because De Gaulleism had, was the Mao's primary example was Gaulle. De Gaulle. De Gaulle was someone who was he had hostilities to to a certain extent the United States. That's how that was the basis of Mao characterizing it as second world they had but enough Turkey sovereignty the, the point was they had enough sovereignty and independence to not make them synonymous with u.s imperialism 
Same thing is true for Turkey and Philip, especially Turkey and the Philippines today, where Duterte conflicts with U.S. imperialism on many issues. So does Erdogan. He doesn't. Duterte doesn't, and Erdogan really. Yes, doesn't. he does. These they Duterte is the definitely Duterte is definitely an enemy of the CIA. All right, there's no doubt about. No, that. he's not. Yes, he is. Duterte, they saw increases of U.S. arms sales and military presence in the Philippines under Duterte, and Duterte also literally pardoned. A U.S. Marine who murdered a transgender Filipina. Okay. Wow. Well, would, well, would for whatever CIA reason, do Duterte is also positioning himself against U.S. hegemony in other ways. But he isn't. He, Why I mean, he look, allow U.S. Troops see what what you're saying completely contradicts the spirit of Mao's position. Mao thought that Chiang Kai-shek and the leader of South Korea. We're positioning themselves against U.S. imperialism in certain respects, right? But you would, if you were living at that time, you would tell Mao, "No, Mao, they're completely in." No, there's you don't understand. No, there's no, dialectical nuance they're to wrong. this. They're wrong. Mao said the only Mao said the only second world country in Asia was Japan. I don't get where you're thinking that. Mao no, Mao said it. Mao in his conversation said even Chiang Kai-shek and the South Korean dictator they're starting to. Position themselves against U.S. imperialism. Mao said that the only country Mao in was Asia not a Maoist dude. World. He said no. it was Japan. He said it was Japan. Okay, and even even if it was Japan, no, no, you're wrong. You're wrong about that. At least when Mao spoke, I think this was in the '70s after Mao's uh, talks with Nixon, right? Which is an, I mean, like Mao was not a Maoist. All right, he was way more pragmatic, way less ideological than Maoists are. When it comes to these things, he was not possessed in of this bourgeois in radicalism. In 1974, with the conversation of Kenneth Kaunda, who was the president of Zambia, Mao said the only country in the second world in Asia is Japan. He did not say Taiwan nor South Korea. Okay, I can look, I can pull up the quote where Mao says, Pull it up. Okay, I need time. Give me time, all right? Because with Kenneth Kaunda, the president of Zambia, when Mao was talking about the three world series... All right, if you're going to just keep talking, I'm not going to pull it up. I can't do two things at once, all right? Like, I'm literally sitting here trying to Google search it, and then you're just lecturing me with shit, and I can't deal with what you're saying because I'm focused on trying to fucking find the quote. So I'm just not going to do it, dude. Choose one or the other. I'm not doing both. Good morning, revolution. See, he called... Who, what nickname did Mao give to Chiang Kai-shek? Because in his conversation, I remember he said even... And he referred to him as his, like, personal nickname that he gave him, not Chiang Kai-shek. So I can't look it up by typing Chiang Kai-shek. When was this talk? Like, who was it with? I, it was, his, it was like, I think it was Zhu and I can't... And Lai, I don't know. I don't remember what it was. It was... In the 70s. After his Nixon. I think it was after his Nixon meeting too. So there's a website called the uh, Wilson Center. Which I got my thing from. Maybe if you look up like, my correspondences on that. It was like a casual conversation they were recording having together. All right, I'll, and they're, I'll ba they're basically saying... All the forces... Uh, the world is turning... The, w the wind of the world is turning against US imperialism... And they're saying even Ch Chiang Kai-shek is turning against them. There's even rifts that are appearing between them. That doesn't mean they're st not still in the same camp. Like, look at it like... Yeah, but you have to... You, like, you're not thinking in Mao's dialectical way. You know, that's the problem. Okay, can you... Look at, look at it was, Saudi it was, Arabia. Look in the 70s. Saudi Arabia and the U.S. obviously had differences over Israel. And there's an oil crisis. That doesn't mean that Saudi Arabia still or wasn't in a country imperialized by U.S. imperialism. It still was. Okay, why did Mao think Charles de Gaulle was... Okay, you know what Mao said? Mao said... Mao. He even talked about... Okay. This is what he said. Um, the United States owes debts everywhere. So this was in 56, even before all this. It owes debts not only to the countries of Latin America, Asia, and Africa, but also to Europe and Oceania. The whole world, Britain included, dislikes the United States. The masses of the people dislike it. Now, when he's making that distinction, he's saying he's not even talking just about the people of Britain. 
He's talking about the governments. Japan dislikes the United States because it oppresses her. None of the countries of the East are free from its aggression. It has invaded our Taiwan province, Japan, Korea, the Philippines, Vietnam, and Pakistan, all suffer from U.S. aggression. Although some of them are allies of the United States, the people are dissatisfied, and in some countries, so are the authorities. Yes, I don't disagree. Okay, so, he doesn't have the black and white mentality. He can still recognize that some countries are positioned in such a way. I, I do have. I have to go though. It's uh, we're at the four hour mark, and it's nearly twelve a.m. I actually went way over when I was supposed to, but we 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 can continue this another time. Or sure. And wow, there's like no one in this space. Unbelievable. All right. Well, I'm ending the space.